Now for a closer look at what's driving the Russian economy, I'm joined by Anton Fedyashin, director of the Carmel Institute of Russian Culture and History at American University. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So a lot of people are wondering, what is the real economic toll that sanctions have taken on Russia? The economic toll has been that uh, access to Western capital has shrunk. And the compensation that the Russians actually expected to come from Asia did not materialize in 2014, 2015. Everyone knows that. This is no uh, secret. The real surprise and the real discovery here is um, that uh, the sanctions on Western capital coming in have had the effect of weaning Russia off of a drug, easy access to Western money, which made it very difficult to reform and modernize the economy, strange as it may sound. Because when money's pouring in from the West and it's fairly effortless to borrow, you don't really want to uh, postpone uh, gratification and invest in reforms at home. Now, as we saw in our, in our report, we're seeing this so-called economic patriotism from Russians. We're seeing them starting their own domestic businesses and more determined to buy Russian products and, and use the services. So even with these sanctions then, just how much of an impact is this economic patriotism having on Russia's economy? Um, an enormous one. Uh, part of it is, of course, uh, sort of a forced patriotism in the sense that the Russian government imposed counter sanctions on Euro uh, imports of European agricultural products. And this is what stimulated the, uh, the agricultural sector of the Russian economy, which, by the way, is the fastest growing one over the past two years. This is why, as your report mentioned, there are plenty of Russian farmers who actually want the sanctions to remain because they need extra time to stimulate their business. So in that sense, the counter sanctions in response to the sanctions have had a very positive effect because Russia had been mired in this um, cycle of not being able to feed itself, which really is very surprising, to put it mildly, for the largest country in the world with an enormous amount of potential. And obviously a lot of oil as well. How, how much do you think though Russia's economy can grow and evolve with oil prices staying as depressed as they are? Uh, the growth and evolution will happen at a slow pace, one and a half to two percent. The Russians are now think, uh, saying that maybe they will surpass two percent by the end of the year. We'll see. Economic predictions are notoriously unpredictable. But um, as long as the oil prices are low, this is a chance for the Russians to invest in their economy and to uh, modernize it. The fact that the ruble collapsed has stimulated an enormous amount of technological exports simply because Russian goods are cheaper to buy uh, for countries abroad in the developing world. So we'll see if the Russian government can uh, organize itself and take advantage of that situation. Now we did see in recent months that Russia's economy grew 3%. What's driving that momentum and how sustainable is it? A lot of it is uh, consumer spending actually, which uh, over the past eight to nine months has suddenly uh, uh, increased. Uh, people have uh, become more confident after the, the doldrums of 2014, 15, and uh, early 16. And so this economic patriotism is really beginning to have an effect on consumer confidence, and that means spending, and that means profits. Now let's also look at Russia's role in the BRICS. What sort of trade activity are we seeing with the partners within the group? Well, the biggest, of course, trade activity is with China by far. And here, um, the Russians are, of course, for the most part, dependent on natural resources. When you look at the list of what the Russians are exporting, it's mostly natural resources to China and a lot more technology and high-end products from China. This may change in the future, but it's going to take uh, a while. It's an unequal partnership. What really makes makes it work is that the Chinese treat the Russians with respect. They do not condescend to them. So the geopolitical component of the economic component is what, what makes this valuable for both sides. And we're certainly seeing that's more the case, a lot of this geopolitical and, and economic ties really crossing over with each other. What about the other countries in the BRICS? Um, much, less, uh, much less trade turnover with uh, the Indians and the South Africans, the Brazilians. Uh, that's uh, straight geography. They're simply too far. And the economic ties, each country is more integrated into its regional um, uh, economic structures than with Russia. Um, I don't see much uh, room for uh, any sort of economic explosions in trade with the other uh, three BRICs. But with China, the possibilities are limitless. And the the Chinese and the Russians have really conducted themselves very patiently and very respectfully towards each other, which really is a, a, a good thing to learn for, for the West in approaching in how to approach both of them. Well, thank you so much for your insights. We'll have to leave it there. Anton Fedyashin, director of the Carmel Institute of Russian Culture and History at American University.